conference, I noticed uh, the uh, guest speaker that's going to be there is a pastor, Bruce Bumgarden, who I met uh, several years ago when I went down to see um, uh, Robbie Dean and uh, went to the uh, Schaefer uh, Systematic Theological Seminary seminar uh, that they had down there in Houston, Texas. And uh, Bruce Bumgarden's also got a ministry out of Pastor Themes uh, a ministry as well. He's got a great ministry down there in Houston as well. Uh, so he's going to be a, a guest speaker there. So Beth, I think we're going to go to this. So I think right now I'm saying I'm going to that. So we'll see. Uh, but in any case, um, uh, and you're all going to pay for it. No, just kidding. <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, be a great uh, seminar, I'm sure. And I'll find out more about that. And I'll uh, talk to you uh, this coming week about it. All right. So uh, let's go to Psalm chapter 40. Psalm chapter 40. And continuing our doxology of God in Psalm chapter 40, we have a psalm that has 17 verses. Again, it's another psalm of David. And this one is in regard to God sustaining his servant. And again, each and every one of us are servants of God as we walk in the will and plan of God on a consistent basis. And in Psalm chapter 40, verses 1 through 17, it says, God sustains his servant. It says, for the choir director, a psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the mire clay, and he set uh, my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud, nor to those who lapse in falsehood. Many, O Lord, my God, are the wonders which you have done in your thoughts towards us. There is none to compare with you. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. And again in verse 7 there, that's a little prophecy or description of Jesus Christ as well. In verse 9, I have Proclaim glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips, O Lord, you know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. You, O Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me. Your loving kindness and your truth will continually preserve me. For evils beyond number have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me, so that I am not able to see. They are more numerous than the hairs of my head, and my heart has failed me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Make haste, O Lord, to help me. To those be ashamed, uh, let those be ashamed and humiliated together who seek my life to destroy it. Let those who turn back and dishonored, uh, and dishonored who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, ah, ah. And and that's kind of an arrogant way. Like, oh, look, 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 because you know. Verse 16. Let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. Since I am afflicted and needy, let the Lord be mindful of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay Oh, my God. So again, a great uh, prayer of deliverance that the Lord gives to his servants as we walk in his faithful plan. All right. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter five, Ephesians chapter five. And we continue to note in this series, God's design for relationship in verses 18 through 21. We talked about the relationship with the Holy Spirit that leads us to have a great relationship with our fellow mankind as we speak to another, one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Then we also ought to be in subjection to one another, serving each other in ultimate fear and respect of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, we had a great understanding of our relationship with the Holy Spirit, the praise that we sing also to God, and then our our relationship with Jesus Christ in those verses. Now as we move on into verse 22 and really to the end of this chapter in verse 33, we see God's design for a great relationship that we all uh, can be entered into and that is the relationship of marriage between our right woman and the right man. And what we understand in these verses, again taking us through the rest of the chapter, is one of God's great divine institutions that he's given to the human race for our freedom, our protection, and also for our guidance day in 
and day out. So I've entered into a doctrine of the divine establishment principles that talk about these four great divine institutions that God has given to us. And what we're going to see, not only in chapter 5, but in the first part of chapter 6, we see two of the four great divine institutions being spoken about by Paul himself. The first one is marriage, that as you know, we'll get into all the detail of that as we get into uh, the doctrines and understanding what these verses have to say. But again, the marriage relationship is our also a, a great analogy of our relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's one of the uh, four divine establishment or institutional uh, uh, policies that God has put in place. And then the second one is family that we're going to see in chapter 6. So we'll talk in detail about family uh, more as well, uh, but we are going to talk a little bit about that this morning. So remember, God has ordained these certain laws to give uh, to the human race for our survival, our protection, our freedom, so that we can go forward as members of the human race. Without these things, there would be nothing but anarchy and destruction, and we would destroy ourselves as they did almost in the time of Noah and as they were leading down that path during the Tower of Babel. But God has given us these divine institutions and establishment principles so that ultimately the human race can continue to go forward. And these institutions and establishment principles are in place from the time of the Garden of Eden to the time of, again, the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Christ that culminates in the millennial reign and then the great white throne judgment that ends human history here on planet earth as we know it. So these laws ultimately directly affect our freedom, our privacy, our authority. It talks about not only in the physical realm of you know the human race and how we live each and every day, but they also help us tremendously in the spiritual realm with our spiritual growth, with further evangelism as we are able to then go out and witness to a lost and dying world. And again, with these four divine institutions that I'm going to note today, they affect all of these things, our civilization and our spiritual growth, so that ultimately we uh, are shown to be victorious inside of the angelic conflict. And remember... <clears throat> that the human race has put here on planet Earth to resolve that angelic conflict. We're part of what is called the appeal trial of the angelic conflict. The angels rebelled against God in eternity past. He sentenced them to the eternal lake of fire with Satan being their leader. They have appealed that, and God then brought in the human race to work out that appeal trial to prove their guilt once and for all, and that will culminate when they are thrown into the lake of fire at the great white throne judgment of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But the human race goes on as this appeal trial to ultimately show and condemn Satan and the fallen angels. And Jesus Christ was really the only witness necessary, but all of us get to be witnesses as part of that appeal trial to show the grace, the love, the mercy, the kindness that is God and to show the guilt of the rebellion of those who reject God and His great plan. Remember, rejecting their creator and their provider of life each and every day. And that also, unfortunately, falls into the human race as well. But under these laws of divine establishment principles, he created these four great divine institutions that we've noted, started noting on Tuesday night, and then finishing up this morning. We've talked about volition. We're going to talk about marriage as we get into more detail. We'll talk about family a little bit today, but also in more detail in Ephesians chapter 6. And then also this morning, what I'm going to spend most of our time on appropriately is nationalism. And as you know, this is our great uh, weekend of Memorial Day celebration. One of the two great celebrations that we have to honor the military and those who have fought in, on, on our behalf. We have Veterans Day in the fall. We have this Memorial Day here in the spring. And this is our time where we remember those who served on our behalf, who gave their lives, especially on this Memorial Day, who gave their lives so that ultimately we could have freedom. And through their great service and the victory that God allowed them to win, giving their deaths on the battlefield, ultimately you and I get to live freely in peace and in this great environment called the United States of America, an environment that has really never existed before in the history of humankind, but all won because of the great victory of those who have fought and also those who have died on the battlefield. And that continues on, and as the Word of God says, you know, until the end of time, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, and ultimately that is part of human history because sin and Satan is in this world. But to protect the human race 
from sin and Satan and the evil that war brings into this world, he has given us these great divine institutions so that ultimately people can be protected from the evil that is out there in the world. And through these four institutions, God protects us from Satan and his cosmic system. That first one that we already noted, um, so I'm going to go through this very quickly, on Thursday night is freedom of choice. You all have freedom of choice to decide for yourself what you are going to do each and every day. And freedom of choice or the volition is part of the soul that is inside of you that God created at the day of your birth and put into your body. And within that soul, you have self-consciousness, where you're self-aware. You have mentality, the ability to think and to discern. You have emotion, the ability to experience and feel. And then ruling all of that, the authority over your soul, is your volition. The freedom to make decisions in regard to your self-consciousness, who and what you are, in regard to the mentality, the decisions that you make, and the control of your emotions each and every day. God has given you that freedom of choice, not only to govern your own body, but also to make great decisions as you go out there on a day in and day out basis. So God has given us this freedom of choice, and he's given us that right so that we can decide for ourselves. And each and every day you can decide what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, where you're going to do it, why you're going to do it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Did I say how you're going to do it? That's in there too. So you have that freedom of choice each and every day. But God also, as part of this angelic conflict, has given us that freedom of choice. And then he's presented to us the gospel of Jesus Christ to either choose for or against the things of God. Remember, we're not robots that God has made us to serve and worship him without any uh, choice of our own. He's given us freedom to make good decisions each and every day, starting with the cross of Jesus Christ and then culminating with the word of Jesus Christ that we can function and operate in each and every day. And with our freedom, again, we can choose to accept the things of God and walk in the plan of God or reject the things of God and the plan that he has for our lives. Then the second great divine institution, which again, I'm not going to talk about tonight because we did a little bit, uh, a, a great series. We had only three weeks, but again, a nice quick uh, series on marriage and relationships that we talked about this past May. But I'm going to get into more detail in the coming weeks as we talk more about Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 33. But this is a great divine institution for the freedom and protection and the perpetuation of the human race. And it is marriage between one man and one woman. And again, men and men marrying each other is an abomination to God. Women marrying women is an abomination to God. These are not designed by God. They are ultimately condemned by the word of God. And we should not operate in those things whatsoever, nor support them in our daily walk. They are a sin, as you know. But for the protection and the freedom and the perpetuation of the human race, God has created marriage between one man and one woman. And again, just think about it. How can two men continue to progress the human race? How can two women continue to progress the human race? It does not happen. But in any case, God has ordained marriage going all the way back to the Garden of Eden when he created the woman to be, again, the partner, that great union that would be joined with Adam. So we have Adam and Eve coming forward as that first great institution of marriage, and we see that perpetuated throughout human history and the importance of it that God has designed. And we're going to talk more about that in the coming days. Then we also have family, which we also will talk when we get to Ephesians chapter 6. And in regard to parents and their responsibility with their children or over their children, but also we have in Ephesians chapter 6 the children's responsibility to respect their parents and all that they have. But the family has been designed so that the parents do have authority over the children to protect for them, care for them, nourish them, provide, train, lift them up so that ultimately they are ready to go out and continue to live life. And you see, that's the number one responsibility that a parent has is to prepare their children for life. 
Again, you don't raise your children to have great friends and buddies for the rest of your life. You prepare your children so that they can go out and live life and to be able to overcome the problems, the difficulties, the details, and to navigate through this world. That's what we are here to do. And there are all forms of discipline that we should be bringing to our children. And when I say discipline, I'm not just talking about spanking them when they get out of line, but the discipline of learning, the discipline of self-control, the discipline as to how to be a productive person in, uh, uh, as a member of our human race within our society. Again, the the parents are given that charge to teach their children these things. And when they do, it's the highest expression of love that a parent could give. Again, a lot of parents like to give their kids gifts and, you know, like them to be their friends and their buddies, and they just want to do good things with them and have, have, have them like them because of the gift giving that they're doing. But if that's all that you do and you're not preparing your children to live in this world, ultimately you are doing them a disservice and you are doing unloving things to them. So again, as parents, we need to raise our children so that they're prepared to go out and, and to continue on the history and society that they are brought up in and the, uh, perpetuate the uh, plan and will of God for their lives as well and for their generation. You see, children must be trained to respect privacy. They must be trained to respect the property of other people. Again, you can't just go and take from anybody anytime you want and think that it's yours. That's why, again, a welfare state that we're developing as a country is wrong in the eyes of God. And it's wrong as far as raising up our children. And as you see in our welfare state, they have generation after generation now that are just living off the government, living off of everybody else. They're taking from everybody else, and they're not doing a lick of work or providing or being contributors to society whatsoever. That's because their parents are not teaching them to get off of welfare and get out there and, and, and live life and be a productive member of society. Again, they need to respect privacy of others, property of others, the rights of others, not to abuse the freedom that they have, and ultimately to respect the authorities that are above them. And if children don't learn to respect authority in this world, they are just going to have a miserable time. If they think that they can make a decision and they can make all the rules anytime, anywhere that they want, there's going to be nothing but anarchy. And they're going to be fighting against this, that, and the other thing throughout their entire lives. And they're never going to receive any kind of discipline in, in, as regard to how they should function, how they should operate. And they're never going to be able to hold a job or be a productive member of society because they don't respect authority. And parents need to train their children in that realm and teach them those things. We'll talk more about that when we get into Ephesians chapter 6. But I'll just leave you with this in regard to family members is that the most important thing that parents need to do is train their children in regard to the Word of God, how to live the spiritual life. Again, you should not be dropping off your children at Sunday school and think the church is going to train them and prepare them for life with all the things of the Word of God. You as individual members should be training your children, raising them up, encouraging them with the Word of God, and teaching them to respect the Word, respect the teaching, and respect the authority in the church being the pastor teacher and get under a pastor teacher sometime during their life as well. Again, in Ephesians and also Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, when, uh, again, the uh, commands and the mandates that God gave to the pe people of Israel, he told those parents, train up your children well. Continually teach them. When you're walking down the path, when you're out in the field, when you're going about your every day, talk about the Word of God. Teach them the things of life in regard to the spiritual realm. Teach them the things of God and how to live in regard to a spiritual life inside a nation or a country that God has given to them. And then it goes on to say, bind it on their foreheads, put it on your, uh, your, your doorposts so that every day your children are seeing the Word of God in your life. And that's what we need to do as parents, and I'll also put it down to grandparents as well. Take that responsibility to the next generation as you go forward. So again, we see that third great divine institution and marriage and family being two of those institutions that are noted here in the book of Ephesians. Then we get into nationalism, which is that fourth great divine institution and a great divine institutional pr uh, principle that God has given to us. And ultimately, this is when we have respect for our nation and the governing people within our nation as well. And nationalism is a fantastic divine institution that God created beginning at the Tower of Babel. 
And again, that's in Genesis chapter 10. We see that in uh, in verse 5 as well specifically. But you can go back and read that at some point in your uh, own uh, studies if you like. But if you haven't done before, I'd highly recommend it. But at that point in time, what was happening? The world spoke one language, and they all kind of were living together and gathered together. And they all collectively got together and were deceived by Satan and the cosmic system to rebel against God. And they built that great tower, and Nimrod was the leader, who was, uh, I I believe, probably possessed by Satan at that point in time. But who knows? It doesn't specifically get into that in Scripture. But ultimately, he got on top of that great tower and took an arrow and shot it up at God in the sky, showing their rebellion and their strength against the God. And again, talk about pathetic, okay? Talk about pathetic. Again, if they only knew. And God showed them it right then and there, and he demonstrated the fourth and created the fourth great divine institution. And at that point, God then looked down at all the people who were down there in rebellion, and then he took segments of the population, and he gave them different languages. And now some spoke French and German and uh, Italian and Russian and whatever other, uh, you know, Hebrew, whatever other uh, languages that were created at that point in time. God then created the various languages of the people, and they all started to look at each other. And they could only understand certain other people at that point in time. And again, uh, God also did it based on their families or their clans as well and uh, grouped them together that way. And then ultimately, they could only speak to uh, certain other people. And they couldn't understand what the other people were saying. And the other people couldn't understand them either. And from there, they broke off. And now you see the table of nations, as it's called within Scripture, where they started to migrate throughout the rest of the world. And those who spoke various languages went off to certain places and established their own societies. And that's when God started to create nationalism within the world. And he did that to break it up because under one language, with one government, under one society, Satan can control that very easily. If everybody's going and leading by, you know, by the same voice, ultimately all you need to do is affect that one voice and you affect all the people, which is what he did with Nimrod and the leadership in that day. And that's why when the Antichrist comes back during the tribulational time period, or not come back, but when he comes uh, during the tribulational time period, when he comes, he's going to uh, try to establish a one world government so that ultimately he can control the entire world under one rule. But that too is going to be unsuccessful and they're only going to have seven years and then God's going to come back and end it all at that point in time, as you know. But in any case, until that happens, God has ordained nations and nations to come together for individual government and autonomousness so that they can go forward as a people. And when you have hundreds and thousands of different nations, it's much harder to influence all of them individually to get them all on the same path doing the same thing. And that's why God broke it up, so that Satan and his cosmic system could not easily influence mankind in a one voice, one way. And broke it up so that ultimately people with their freedom of choice and their freedom of, uh, uh, of volition could go forward to either choose or reject the things of God and ultimately either go for Satan and his world or go for God and his great plan that he would have for their lives as a collective people so nationalism is that thing and as a nation we need to respect our nation we need to honor our nation we need to support our nation on a consistent basis and as you'll see in the principles and as you already know and as i've said the military is one great way that we continue to be protected as a people and as a nation And if we had a weak military, if we didn't have strong military uh, forces within the United States of America, other nations would come in and wipe us out. Because other nations that are led by Satan, who disagree with the word of God, and don't want to have that in the world at all, they would come and quickly take over, not only grabbing our wealth and riches, but also changing the way we are able to freely worship our Lord. So again, with a strong military, those things are defended. And with a strong military, we can also help defend other nations that are being overrun by tyranny or dictators or other types of evil that are in this world, as we did in World War I and World War II and have tried to do in other uh, wars and conflicts since uh, going forward. So again, with a strong military, we have freedom and protection.
But remember, God has designed our nation to protect us, to give us the freedoms and the rights of people and all the people here on planet Earth. But unfortunately, some people, because they've rejected the things of God, place themselves under a dictatorship or some other type of evil, tyrannical government or leadership. And they are under that rule and authority because they haven't respected their freedom or they don't want freedom. They just want to be told what to do. And uh, uh, maybe on Tuesday night I'll, I'll share with you, but I've showed you in the past that uh, that uh, the, the great theory, uh, or, or you could even say law, of the cycle of nations. And there are basically like you know eight cycles that a nation goes through, starting in slavery and then ultimately coming to a place of freedom and prosperity. But because of that freedom and prosperity, they ultimately go all the way back to slavery as a result. And it's it's amazing and uh, uh, when you see the cycle of nations how it's been shown time and time again throughout the history of mankind where people ultimately under slavery, they just want freedom now, and so they fight for that. And ultimately they come to a place of freedom and prosperity. But then when they get the freedom and prosperity, now they start to abuse their relationship with God and they start to worship the prosperity over their God. And ultimately they then go back downward and they go into the downward spiral where ultimately now they want the government to take care of them. They want the government to pay for this that and the other thing. And did anybody see this past week, Mark Zuckerberg, I think, is that his name, Mark Zuckerberg, the guy for Facebook who designed it? He did a speech in Harvard, and he's coming up with a new theory, and he's talking about he wants uh, equal income now for everybody, okay? So it's not being on the welfare state, but he thinks everybody should be in equal income because without having equal income, we're not allowing people to flourish in their life and to come up with new ideas and new thoughts and new designs. So the government should get everybody the same income and we should all get paid the same so that ultimately we could flourish and have new ideas come to the fore. And that's exactly what I said. He can give me his, some of his come, his income. And I, you know, and I, yelling at the TV as I usually do, but again, uh, with, with my wife, <laughs> telling my wife, I said, yeah, that'd be great, Mark Zuckerberg, if you want to limit everybody to make no more than $40,000 a year, let's say. And everybody makes $40,000 a year, including you, who has $8 billion or trillion, I don't know, you know how much this guy has now. Billions and billions of dollars. And that's slavery, exactly. That gets us right back to slavery. But again, if you, you know, think it's so great, why don't you give your money? And again, these Hollywood people and these actors that are making millions of dollars and some of these other individuals like industry leaders who are making millions and billions of dollars, yet they want the government to give everybody the same income so that while they still have their billions and millions. Hey, dude, you can come live in my house anytime you want and live like me for the rest of the time, and I'll help you distribute your money to the rest of the world. I'll help you with that. Come on down. Again, it's just part of Satan's cosmic system. Where it, again, where we want to go back to the government taking care of us, and as, uh, as uh, was just said, ultimately that leads us right back into slavery. Because if the government's giving to you your income each and every day, they're also dictating what you can and cannot do each and every day. So again... It's a flawed, failed system. It's been shown time and time again to be just that. But freedom and prosper uh, freedom is what brings about prosperity. Freedom is what brings about even more equality than what we have had before. But the more we get under a, a tyrannical kind of uh, socialistic uh, government state, ultimately we get ourselves into more and more difficulty as a people, leading all the way back to slavery. So Webster's Dictionary defines a nation as a group of people who have common language of religion or traditions or history, institutions, and or customs. And that's what has happened and throughout the world. And God has allowed the world to make their own decisions. He's allowed them to go out and, and into these various places and to establish their own countries and ultimately their languages and their, uh, or with their language, and, but uh, also their institutions and the customs that they have. But at the same time, we're going to see, and I'll show you a few passages in just a minute, God also is overseeing all of that. Because remember, Jesus Christ controls history and God has ordained it from eternity past. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. But let me give you this point before I show you some scriptures, is that each nation occupies a designated geographic location 
that God has established from eternity past. Remember, God knows all things. He always has, always known, and always will know all things. And from eternity past, God knew when the United States of America would come to the fore. He also knows when the United States of America will go under. And he knows that, and it has been foreordained based on his omniscience, uh, it, it is all knowingness. But also God is there working in the lives of the people within nations based on whether they are accepting or rejecting the word of God as they go forward. And we see that in the great microcosm of the people of Israel. When the people of Israel would be following God and uh, abiding by his laws and commandments and his mandates, God would bless them out of their minds. And they had fantastic blessings. But every time he would give them blessings, what would they do? They'd turn to the false gods and the false worship and the false idol, and they would reject God. And as a result, God would bring his divine discipline upon the people. So we see that as a great uh, you know, example of what can happen to any nation, especially the nation of the United States of America, that we call a client nation unto God, because this is a nation that believes in God and has put God in the fore. And even our leaders have been led by God over the years. But again, as you're starting to see, we're getting more and more away from our God. And if we do that, then ultimately we're going to have God's discipline come into our lives as a people and as a nation as well. But in any case, you know, God wants to bless our nation. He wants us to follow his plan. He gives us all the information necessary so that we can go forward. And he wants to pour his grace out onto us each and every day. But he is the one that has foreordained the boundaries, the nation that we have. As Acts chapter 17, verse 20. It says, and he made from one man, being Adam, and then going uh, next to Noah, every, uh, excuse me, from one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. And so again, God has preordained this and appointed this. It's all part of his divine will and plan for the history of mankind. And remember, he's trying to protect mankind throughout history. And as Human history goes on and evil reigns in various areas and they try to take over others. God's always going to raise up those that a group of people that are positive towards the word of God so that he can raise them up to be a great guardian of the word and be a great guardian of freedom for those who would want to have it throughout the world. And again, we aren't to be going out and being nation builders as the United States of America, but if there are people that want freedom and yet a, t a, a dictator, a, a you know, tyrannical nation is coming after them, we should stand to defend them if they want defense so that they can continue to have freedom and, autonomous a, uh, and be autonomous as a nation. And I love that, determine their appointed times. Again, God knows when the ra nation is going to raise up. He knows when it's going to go down. Again, when the United States of America was first established, those great pilgrims came over the sea, they came over in all those hardships to come over here and ultimately establish a new place of living that has freedom, getting away from the ty uh, tyranny of the kingship that was going on during the British Empire days. And just think of the British Empire. And a great, I'll just give you a great example. You know, God raised them up as a great people because they were going forward with the plan of God. And they basically conquered the world, um, as it were, and ultimately helped freedom and prosperity throughout the entire world. And what was their flag? A red cross on a white background. And then somewhere along the way, they changed that and they have the what we call now the Union Jack and took that cross and kind of blended it in with all kinds of other colors and everything. And then what happened? The United Kingdom went right down. And part of that United, uh, the United Kingdom and the empire that uh, used to be the great British Empire, again, kept losing territory after territory after territory after territory. And ultimately because they walked away from God. And they became more about themselves than they did about a God and following him. And during that process, God raised up, uh, you know, the United States of America, starting with the great godly pilgrims that came over and established a new society. And then from there, he established a nation during what we call the American Revolution, which was more an emancipation, not a revolution. A revolution is when you throw off a government and then ultimately establish a new. They didn't go and wipe out King George. They left him keep that place. But ultimately, they emancipated themselves when they took over what they originally had established here in the United States of America, a free people with a free nation. 
Ultimately, uh, uh, the kingdom tried to put its uh, dominance on it and said what you can do, what you can't do, what you can believe, what you can't believe. And that's why the pilgrims came over in the first place, and that's why we had, quote-unquote, the revolution, which is better termed emancipation rather than revolution. But in any case, God knew when that would happen. God allowed those things to happen, and it took several hundred years. But as he saw England going down, he then raised up the United States of America to be that great beacon, that great hope of life light shining in the world that continues to present the gospel message and evangelize throughout the entire world while protecting the freedoms and privacy and property of not only its own people but those who may be under dictatorship or tyranny from other nations and the biblical proof that god builds nations and they are authorized by god include genesis chapter 10 and deuteronomy 32 verse 8 and what we just noted in acts chapter 17 let me show you genesis where it says and again tower of babel is in view here it says from these the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands every one according to his language according to their families into their nations and that's when he mixed up the the languages of the people at the tower of babel and then they started going off to god's pre-appointed places to establish nations and countries inside those areas again so that people could be free and protected rather than being overruled by satan or ruled by satan in his cosmic system under a one one leader one government type of relationship so in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, this is reiterated. It says, When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when He separated the sons of man, He set the boundaries of the people. And unfortunately, there's a kind of a bad translation here in the English where it says, According, and I actually put the L-E on the end of, uh, Y, I should say, on the end of this, and according to the number of the sons of Israel, this makes you think it's just talking about Israel, and all the other nations came from them. But ultimately, that word accordingly is not in the Hebrew original language uh, and translations of the Bible. Ultimately, it should not be there. It's been added. So I put it as accordingly to the number of the sons of Israel. In other words, what this verse is saying is as he did this with all the other nations with the Tower of Babel, he also did it with the sons of Israel. And he brought them into the Promised Land, and then the territories were bro broken up by the 12 tribes of Israel, and he gave them their land. So again, that's what we see here, all part of God's divine plan and uh, preordained plan for the history of mankind. So, as we know, God sovereignly controls the establishments, uh, uh, the establishment of nations and also their destruction, their rise and their fall, as we've seen it. And as one nation that maybe was a godly nation starts to fall, he will raise another nation up. If the United States of America is on a downward path of falling, turning away from God, rejecting Him, making people not be able to be free in their worship and service of Him, as we started to see over the last decade or so, Hopefully now we're going to see a reversal of that as the pendulum switches back more to freedom these days. But ultimately, if those freedoms were taken away and churches were dictated what they could and could not do, the nation would go down. But God would raise up another one, and who knows what that other nation could be. Maybe it's the nation of China. Which toilet you could use or not, right? Right, dictated to you that. You only have freedom with that. But in any case, yep, but he will raise up another nation of godly people because, again, he will continue to allow freedom to ring to protect those who want to have freedom and ultimately choose for God. So we see this in Jonah. We see it in Isaiah. We also see it in the book of Daniel in several verses. And remember, just like all the other divine institutions and all the divine establishment principles, Satan opposes them. He's against your freedom of choice. He doesn't want to give you the opportunity to make decisions for God. He wants to dictate to you to live a life against God. In marriage, haven't we seen that attacked over the last 50 years with divorce rates being running rampant within our nation? Again, the attack of Satan, a divine institution number two. And that also then leads to families and the attack there and what's happening uh, uh, you know, within our family unit. Ultimately, destroy marriage, you're also going to have a good chance to destroy the family unit as well. Or you do destroy that. 
and you have problems and difficulties. But at the same time, we also see children being emboldened. And again, it's not so much the, uh, you know, in our recent uh, history, but I remember over the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years, we saw children taking their parents to court because they disciplined them too much. And the courts would go along with the children. Again, wrong, wrong, and more wrong. So again, we see Satan's attack there against the family unit. But we also see his attack against the, na the nations of the world where he doesn't want nationalism. What he wants is internationalism. He wants us all to be living under one accord, one way of doing things, and you know, so that ultimately he control what is going on throughout all the people in the entire world. He just doesn't like the opportunity. He just doesn't like it when we have hundreds of different nations who are all autonomous doing what they want to do because it's so much harder for him to control those things. That's why I'm glad with things like what we're seeing with our current president, he's breaking away from that internationalism that the previous president was bringing us into. Getting away from this Paris Accord of climate control, which is nothing but a myth and just a money grab for all these other nations. Getting away from having uh, uh, the United Nations be the leaders and rulers of law and what we are to do and what we're not to do. We need to get away from those things if we're going to continue to be a nation unto God. But Satan is trying to attack the nationalism, and he wants internationalism, and that's what he's going to bring in during the tribulational time period, or at least try to, so that he can control the peoples of the world and get them away from God and get them to follow him. So again, nationalism is a great design by God to provide two things at a minimum internal and external security. And that's what a nation is to do. Internal, within our borders, keep us safe. And then from the enemies that are trying to attack us from without. They are to uphold that for us each and every day. And we as citizens of our nation are to honor that as we go forward. As you should be honoring your nation this weekend with Memorial Day, somehow in some way. Don't just take tomorrow as a day off, but give thanks to God for what he has done for us. The great military and the men and women that have died on your behalf. Give thanks to God. Go see a parade or serve somehow in some way. Help out the vets in any way you can. But serve as, and give honor based on what God has done for us within our nation. Serve and honor your nation. Don't just take your nation for granted, but give back. Again, Kennedy said it great. You know, ask not what your country can do for you. Instead, ask what you can do for your country. And again, that's what we should be doing in our nation. We should be doing that for God. Not what can God give to me, but what can I give back to God? And you should be doing it for the body of Christ as well. That should be the mentality of each and every one of us. And again, in nationalism, serving and honoring our nation. From an external uh, you know, perspective, again, having a great military to stop any other dictators or other type of evil empires that want to come in and have a money grab and take over our resources and take us and enslave us to serve them in somehow in some way. And that happens, as you can see, throughout the world and the history of the world. You've seen that happen time and time again. But for the client nation unto God, the godly people that are going forward, he's going to have them have a strong military so that they can defend from those who otherwise would come in and attack and take over. Ultimately, God wants freedoms, and he will protect those who are honoring freedom and honoring their nations. Then from the internal perspective, again, understand what criminality is, especially applying what the Word of God has to say about sin and crime and evil that can be purported from one to another. Ultimately, define that for the people and then execute judgment against those who break the laws. That's why we need to have good, you know, uh, good laws on our books with good judges behind the benches and uh, you know, good people that serve, like Dan had to serve this past week. He got uh, hooked up on a jury down in Fall River, a superior court, very difficult case he's going to be uh, working on. Again, we all look at it and say, oh, it's a pain, I've got to be on jury and all this and that and the other thing. But ultimately, we have to remember, this is part of our service to our nation. When we serve on a jury and are helping you know, our fellow mankind to determine innocent or guilt based on the laws that are in our book, based on divine establishment principles, ultimately it's a great service that we give to our country. And rather than papoing it like, oh, I got jury duty, we should be honored that we have the opportunity to do that. And again, I'm sure all of you have served at some point or another in your life, and Dan's serving this week, so thank you, Dan, for what you're going to do. This 
this coming week and all of you who be a service in that way. It's part of helping and supporting our nation. And it's something we should do. Because our nation needs to define criminality and then execute justice in regard to it so that the population is not exploited, so that your freedoms aren't taken advantage of, so that your property and privacy isn't taken advantage of by other individuals. In Deuteronomy, when God talked to the people of Israel, when they established their nation or he established their nation, ultimately he gave them great laws in regard to that. So you and I as believers in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ are to recognize that there are no physical or spiritual authorities that exist in this world that God has not ordained. Let's go to Romans chapter 13. Let's go to Romans 13. And this is one of the great passages that we have within Scripture. Again, Paul uh, being inspired by the Holy Spirit writing in regard to the principles of God as to how we should honor our nation. And in honoring our nation, we need to honor the leaders that have uh, been ordained to lead us. And we have to remember that whoever is in authority, whether it be at the federal, state, or the local level, God has ordained every one of those individuals to be in that position of power. As it says in Romans 13, 1, it says, Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinances of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. Wherefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Again, for your own peace of mind. For because of this, you also pay taxes. That's part of honoring your government. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Then in verse 8, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. So part of your divine establishment principle and part of your divine love is to honor your nation in all its shapes, forms, and sizes, and the leaders that are governing over your country at that particular time. And God brings them in for whatever specific reason he wants for that nation, and he will utilize them. And remember, too, they are accountable to God, whether they know it or not. So if you don't like your leaders or if you think your leaders are evil, start praying for them. Pray for them to rebound and recover. Pray for God to work in their lives. Remember, Paul wrote this during a time that the Roman empires thought that they were gods with Nero and the other evil empires. And yet Paul wrote this passage to us. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 because we're going to see Peter speak about this as well. So we don't just think, oh, this is just Paul speaking. No, Peter, another one of the apostles, in regard to his divine inspiration by the Holy Spirit. In Second Peter chapter, excuse me, First Peter chapter two, in verse thirteen. Yeah, we'll go to First Peter. Because the point is, again, you know, having this establishment principle, it requires that we again give honor and authority within our nation and within our state, and then also at the local government as well, within our towns or our cities. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 uh, through 17, it says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men. Again, you're free. You have freedom of volition, freedom of choice. And do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as a bond slave of God. 
honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So again, regardless of whether you like or dislike whoever might be the president of the United States or the governor of your state or even the selectmen or mayors of your towns and cities, again, you have to honor them. You may not like their policy and their practices and their procedures, but you have to honor the position and thereby honor them and give them the respect and authority uh, that God has ordained in them. And then ultimately you need to follow their rule, follow their law as it has been established. So a couple of points and then we'll be done for this morning is that the word of God does not sanction things like conspiracies and anarchy and revolution or even assassination or any attempt at all to undermine legitimate governments that have been brought into this world. Sometimes illegitimate governments happen, things like military coups when they take over the leadership and they aren't duly elected, or other, uh, you know, uh, uh, piracy like you're seeing with the ISIS individuals going on in our day and age. Again, that's not legitimate authority. Again, that's evil and tyranny that is being brought into the world. Those things are not legitimate by God, but more uh, perpetuated by Satan and his rule. But ultimately, the word of God does not sanction us overthrowing our legitimate governments. Again, no conspiracy, revolution, assassination, anything like that. And remember, the American Revolution was an emancipation proclamation. It was not a revolution because we did not overthrow King George. We did not, you know, send our ships to England and say, we're going to take over the government now. No, we just said this land that God gave to us, you've taken it over and you're putting evil rule onto this when it wasn't designed to be that in the first place. So we're throwing you off as our authority as we should. We're emancipating to establish the government uh, that we are establishing. So very different than uh, the revolution that uh, was uh, a thing like we ha that they had in Paris about that same, or France during that same time period. But again, that's a history lesson for another day that we can talk about. But in any case, as we see, we should not be doing that, and we should be honoring our governing authorities, honoring our nation, and especially the military that has given us the freedoms and protection that we so currently richly enjoy. And then we also have in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 3, if you don't like your government, and if you do like your government, the one thing you should be doing each and every day is praying for your government, as 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 through 3, and uh, Ephesians and also uh, 2 Thessalonians 3 through 1 tell us praying for our government so that the word of God can continue to be proclaimed. And that's how we should be serving our country in a fantastic way by praying each and every day for our military leaders, our government leaders, whether it be the president or the Senate or the Congress, the Supreme Court, you know, whatever the case may be, praying for them day in and day out that God work in their lives. And remember that God does hear your prayers and he does answer your prayers. And if a godly people are coming together to pray for the nation, God is going to bless that nation and he's going to put in the leaders that the nation needs so that the nation can continue to be blessed and continue to have strong laws and a strong military so that our freedoms continue to reign. All right, so I'll uh, close there this morning and uh, we'll pick it up uh, on Tuesday when we talk even more in regard to divine institutions and their importance. All right, so let's just close in prayer right now. Father, we thank you for this time of praise and worship. We thank you for giving us the great nation of the United States of America. And we thank you for the freedoms and prosperity and the protections and laws that we have. And we continue to pray for our leaders uh, that are there serving us each and every day, that are watching over us on, our, on your behalf, ultimately to carry out your will and plan for our country. And this morning, Father, we also pray for Dot Kidder. We ask that you bring healing and guidance into her life. And Help her with her physical realm. We ask that you be with Karen's dad in his upcoming surgery and allow all to go well with his stress test as well and allow his health to continue to be strong and also be with Kelly, Father, and help her in her spiritual walk and all that she needs in her physical life as well and continue to guide and lead and protect her according to your will. And Father, again, we continue to pray for our great nation and our great military and our policemen and our firemen and all of those who are serving and protecting on our behalf. We ask that you be with them and protect and guide them and lead us to honor, serve, and, worship, uh, and glorify them as we worship you this day. So, Father, we thank you for our time. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right, thank you very much. And now is the time where we could partake of an offering.
part of our service and sacrifice unto the Lord. This is our last uh, offering of the month, so hopefully we have a good offering this morning to meet the needs that we have. <coughs> um, also, uh, just to let you know in regard uh, to the offering, um, we've got some designs to change the placard on the sign out here, uh, getting our, our church logo up there and uh, just uh, cleaning it up a bit uh, from what it is today. So uh, hopefully in the next week or two we'll be able to uh, do that. It's going to be about $350 or so. Sue's been doing uh, uh, the legwork on that, and uh, hopefully we can put that in uh, in the coming weeks. But uh, keep that in prayer as well, and also the finances necessary to uh, 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 get the new sign. All right, so well, let's just pray for our offering. Father, we thank you for this time to give to you. We give to you all the first fruits of what you've given to us. And Father, we just offer these things back to you in thanksgiving and in praise for all the blessings that you have given us. And we give our offering now in Christ's precious name. Amen. <coughs> oh, okay, the music ministry is